So Jonathan Melnick, uh, Senior Analyst from Lux Research. He leads the wearable electronics, electronic user interfaces, sensors, and the digital health and wellness intelligence services. So let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to share some of the research we've done at Lux around um, the digital transformation in general as it, as it hits almost every industry now. And really apply that to, to what's going to happen in healthcare as we take lessons from other industries and apply them to healthcare, as healthcare is sometimes one of the, uh, the, the, the slower moving. Oh. A little bit of background um, about Lux. So we provide information advisory services typically to large companies. We help them plot their innovation strategies, then execute on it uh, by doing technology scouting, by finding uh, competitors um, and, and general market research. So I'm going to start talking about what do I mean by digital disruption and what's happening in some other industries where you can learn some lessons about as this wave of digitalization comes, what happens? What are the dynamics? What are the reasons that this is um, applicable to healthcare? Why is, why is healthcare at, at risk here? And then as we think about the implications, how do we at the end of the day find business opportunities from it? So I'm going to start with a bunch of words. Always compelling to start a talk with a bunch of words. Don't read all of them. It's telling you that electronics companies care about health. I know, mind blown. Who knew? The bombshell of CES right here. But, they're saying, but big electronics companies are saying they're doing it, and they're investing in it. They're putting their money where their mouth is. Let's look at the type of culture, the type of markets that electronics companies are used to playing in. They play in fast growing and changing markets. This is smartphones over three years, the types of markets that electronics companies are used to playing in. When we look at the market share of smartphones over that three year period, you have the leaders in 2009 totally wiped off the map in 2012. So what happens? You have these very quickly growing markets that eventually mature and get locked in. This is not unique to smartphones either. This has been happening for decades in electronics. Look at the early 80s when we, when we talk about the market share of um, operating systems in PCs, and PCs took over, continue to dominate today. Healthcare is different than this. Shocking, I know. If we look at the top insurance companies, for example, it doesn't change very much. It's a pretty static from a market share perspective. I mean, you fight, over, fight at the edges, but you don't see this wild industry disruptions take place in healthcare the way that they do in electronics. I'm going to talk about cars for a minute. Am I, going to, I might be the only speaker that's going to talk about cars in, in, in this session. But um, the reason I'm going to talk about it is it has one of the hallmarks, and we see this coming in automotive now, as electronics become a bigger and bigger piece of the car. 1970, 3% of the car, not, not a big deal. They call up a tier one supplier, and they get, they get what they need. It's a radio, and it's fine. It's 30% now. It's going to be 50% soon. And that opens up the door for electronics companies like Apple to service now and also look to the future of really taking over being the primary players in this market, no longer being driven by, um, by automotive companies. And then you see the response to this from automotive companies, right? So there's the old line folks that say, well, psh, we take steel. We make things out of steel. And is that the differentiating quality now in a car is it how do you mold steel, or is it how do you do data and information? Because as you start to look at these industries as they rub up on each other, right? an OEM is used to a very slow, deliberate process of, of, and supply chain, where a, uh, an electronics company, while the supply chain might look similar, they operate at very different speeds. A new car model every four to seven years that's a lifetime for an electronics company. The culture of innovation doesn't exist there the sp in the same way because the speed and disruption isn't there either. So while some companies don't take this threat very seriously, other ones that do. 
And they see this as a real threat to their business if their business and their core capabilities stop being the differentiating factor in what drives growth. So for example, the Daimler CEO that doesn't want to do the commodity production for Apple, who's going to capture the, the lion's share of the profit pool. So let's now take this type of dynamic and apply it to healthcare. Is, is healthcare at risk? What does it look like? Well, if you look at the current structure of the hospital, it's, it dates back a while, and it made sense when hospitals started. It's a couple hundred years old. It made sense. The best way to treat somebody is to have expertise in the system. You had to know what the condition was about at a base level, and you needed to know how to treat it that way. But at what point do conditions start being more about data and understanding the data behind, behind it than it does about understanding the base proteins? and the base condition and the base medical system, and how does that interplay work? So if we look at how, for example, uh, different aspects of how data is handled today, you know, we're talking about you know, the exam starting with some qualitative symptoms that, that trigger somebody to go in, the doctor has a conversation, you then take the data, you maybe write it down, you store it in a central repository, you need to secure that because you need to be HIPAA compliant, the doctor will make referrals, and every, every time the patient needs to go and needs to be centralized. But if you look to the future, that's not really how it's gonna work, right? There's gonna be much more data-driven decisions. You know, we're gonna think about storage being much more distributed, blockchain becoming a really big deal in a lot of different industries right now. The role of AI, of course, being a big deal. And then how do you deal with this decentralization of care? And who are the experts in it? Is it the caregivers or is it these data and electronics companies that have been doing this forever? So now if we take this idea of this is going to shift into be more of a data-oriented business, what does that look like now? And how would we redesign um, how healthcare is structured now? So if we take the, the, the departments before and we can, we can attach conditions to them, some of the more, more prevalent, more expensive ones, it's not how we would necessarily structure a hospital today based on data and information. We would think about it more from how do you have core monitoring and sensing capabilities, right? How do you turn that into a diagnosis? And that transition doesn't necessarily mean that it is reflective of what the condition is. They can be totally separate. Predictive analytics, therapeutics, right? How do you actually assist somebody with a medical condition, right? What role of enabling function that people have lost or never had through electronics? That is very different and does not necessarily, again, come back to what the condition is. Or a theme that we've talked about quite a bit, behavior augmentation. So if we start thinking about the links between these types of conditions, this is just for predictive analytics uh, in this case, and just a couple of small examples, you can look at, hey, now asthma and epilepsy are kind of related because they're episodic, and being able to predict when the next um, episode is going to take place is really powerful, right? And it doesn't really matter that one, one is a uh, respiratory disease. The other one is, it isn't. It, it doesn't matter. It's about finding patterns in the data now and being able to predict going forward. The same way that asthma and diarrheal diseases are now linked because environmental factors are such a big deal. And as we're sensing the environments in which people are operating, linking that to them having episodes now becomes the critical feature, not what's causing the condition. So as we build this out across our six different uh, ways of thinking about uh, medicine and healthcare from a digital perspective. These are all links of things that are going on today. We, we're, I'm just not creative enough to come up with what could be done. This is what developers are doing today. And the backend solutions that are connecting diseases that you're not really thinking about because the way people are thinking about it now is very much old line thinking around what is the condition and treating the condition. But that's cool, and it's a pretty picture. We call this, call this figure the dream weaver. I like it. Um, but the question after that is then, how do you make money? If this is the transition you've seen coming in other industries, we think it's coming in healthcare, how do you make money from it? How do you build up core capabilities? Start with just looking at a simple example like temperature sensing. And what are the types of things you can do if you really build up core capability and expertise in just temperature sensing? 
You can do things like fertility tracking, a critical component temperature sensing is to a company like Ava Sciences that helps uh, companies that, or couples that are having trouble conceiving um, find the optimal time um, to track. Same temperature sensing then goes into breast cancer screening. A company like Circadia Health, where women would wear around this uh, elegant garment for 24 hours and would give a risk profile on the chances of breast cancer. Goes into epileptic seizure prediction. Again, all core capabilities that get um, combined with other sensors to give really valuable advice, diagnostics, treatment around chronic care. The same thing as we look at childhood development. Again, temperature sensing being this core capability, and temperature sensing is just one example. As you again break down these conditions, these technologies, from a data and electronics perspective, it looks very different and informs how you'd want to build up core capabilities, how you'd want to um, devise your R&D strategies. So as we look at this and we look at how healthcare is performed and we start to match that up with how electronics would look at it, where's this shear going to happen? Right? How are these two things going to interplay in the future? Because right now they're very siloed and eventually they're going to come together and overlap. And how do they actually start to play off each other? Because what it means is that healthcare providers are really going to need a lot of core capabilities in electronics. Because it's not to say that healthcare expertise is going away, but it's going to get augmented and diluted in the value that it provides to patients. And then if that happens, and if you're dealing with different design cycles, and you're dealing with different um, approaches, at the end of the day, where's the value going to go, and who's going to capture more of the profits out of this transition becomes the key question. Um, and how much of that is going to go over to the electronics companies versus staying with, with existing healthcare providers. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak and share some of our research.